My name is Carrie Brown. I'm the director of the social journalism program at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, our very first class is graduating in about one week. So if anyone needs any um, students that know a lot about social media listening and community engagement, come talk to me. I got, I got a few of those. Um, I'm excited about this part of the program because like the last panel, we're really going to be trying to look at the future of data journalism. Um, and it's really exciting to kind of go beyond what all the cool things that are possible today and look at the new tools that we're going to have to look forward to coming up soon. Um, so our first up is Meredith Broussard, an assistant professor at NYU's Journalism School came here recently from Temple. She will talk to us about artificial intelligence and data. So pretty cool stuff. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So I'm going to talk today about artificial intelligence and new tools to supercharge investigative reporters. So in recent years, artificial intelligence has become increasingly valuable to journalists. We have automated writing, which is helping journalists to more efficiently cover routine stories uh, in sports and business. So the AP is using uh, technology from automated insights. We've also got narrative science, which does automatic story writing. Um, and then Bloomberg is also using, uh, using AI and automated writing to do uh, stories based on, uh, on stock fluctuations. And then another facet of artificial intelligence is machine learning. So machine learning is helping journalists to understand large data sets. So that's resulted in document analysis tools like the Overview Project or Document Cloud. And now a third dimension of artificial intelligence is showing promise uh, in helping journalists to find stories in data. And that's what my work is about. My work is about expert systems. So I, I build tools. I build very highly specialized computational tools in order to help investigative reporters more quickly and efficiently uncover, uh, uncover new investigative story ideas in government data. And I am working right now on a tool I call the Story Discovery Engine. The reason why uh, a story discovery engine is efficient is that the story is the base economic unit in journalism. So we, we know how to generate traffic, right? We know cat videos will generate traffic. And uh, that, that piece of the puzzle uh, we've, we've figured out. But there's this other piece of the puzzle, which is watchdog journalism, uh, the kind of high impact public service journalism that's really essential to democracy because the media serves the, uh, a watchdog function in a democracy. And so the more, what I'm interested in is I'm interested in helping journalists uncover more high impact watchdog journalism stories uh, and tying these to revenue opportunities and uh, helping us to, uh, to sort of work better as a democracy. So how the story discovery engine works is it makes a simple comparison and detects an anomaly. And what I do is I compare what should be to what is. Right? What should be is articulated in laws and policy. And what is is articulated in data. And so as a reporter, whenever I find a mismatch between what should be and what is, I think, huh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on there. That is an opportunity for an investigative story. So the story discovery engine, what it does is it takes this enormous data set and it takes these enormously complex uh, rules as articulated in laws and policy and puts them together and shows the journalist where are these anomalies. And then the journalist can follow up on each of these anomalies and discover an investigative story. Now, as we have many journalists out here. You know that whenever you discover something weird, you go and investigate it, and it's, it's different on the ground every single time. So the story that human writes out of that anomaly is going to be different every time. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this. This is uh, the last, pro last big project that I did. It is online. It's called at stackedup.org. And this was an investigative project about textbooks in Philadelphia public schools. 
Now, the same people uh, write the standardized tests and write the books that students need to pass the standardized tests. So you can't pass the test unless you have the books. And I wondered if maybe Philadelphia schools uh, couldn't get their students to pass, test, pass the standardized tests because the students didn't have the books. I also wondered, is there enough money to buy the books? So big finding was, no, there's not enough money, and no, there's not enough books. This is an investigative story that would not have been possible without new computational tools. The tools to investigate this didn't exist, so I had to invent them. Uh, so what I'm doing now as a fellow at the Tau Center is I'm building another dis story discovery engine for campaign finance data. I'm taking this idea of what should be, which is articulated in laws and policy around campaign finance, and I'm looking at what is in campaign finance data. And the idea is that the story discovery engine is going to be a tool for uncovering potential campaign finance fraud. So here's a really simple example. The, uh, the limit on individual donations is $2,700. If somebody gives $2,800, there's supposed to be a refund. And so if you see that in the campaign finance data that the refunds are being regularly issued for donations over $2,700, you know that that campaign is you know, functioning really well. But if you see that donations over $2,700 are regularly not being refunded, well, you've got not only a violation of the law, but you've also got a clue that maybe something else is going on. Maybe there's something going on with the treasurer at this organization. Maybe you can look at, well, is this treasurer working for uh, multiple uh, political organizations? Uh, is, there maybe a, is there maybe a trend going on here? So it's the data that has actually led us to the, uh, the new story. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next up, we have Brian Charles, the Chief Technology Officer at DataViz, a data-driven virtual reality studio here in New York. We've seen some recent experiments with news organizations like the New York Times using uh, virtual reality, but I think we're you know, just right at the very cusp of what's possible in that medium. Thank you very much. Um, so I think you all know what this is uh, by this point. So I'm just going to leave this up here as sort of a good luck charm. I think when we think about um, the video we saw this morning and people wondering, you know, oh, are we going to really be watching TV and getting our news from TV? Just think about what we'll be saying about this silly little thing in 10 years. Um, so what I'm going to show you uh, is I'm going to show you a demo uh, of a virtual reality piece, that I, a prototype that I built, and then talk about some of kind of the questions and lessons that come out of that, because we learn a lot. There's a lot to kind of unpack here. Um, this is a piece that I built while I was in a fellowship at POV uh, through the Knight Foundation. So thank you, uh, Shazna and Marie. Um, what we're looking at is a simulation of New York City. Uh, the map and the buildings are pulled from open street maps in real time. Um, this works in an Oculus Rift, and it's run in a web browser. Uh, and these little floating dots, uh, these are um, uh, data representation pulled from the US Census. So every little floating particle represents a person, and they're color-coded by race. So as you, you can sort of fly around, I can go anywhere um, in the United States with this. And as you fly around, you go from one neighborhood to the, to the next, and the density and distribution of the data uh, kind of are reflected in these particles. Um, this was, uh, I was, as I was working on this, I was traveling in Sweden, and it's kind of inspired by this experience because uh, I live here in New York, and I'm just used to sort of walking down the street and seeing uh, a variety of faces. And when I was walking in Sweden, it was a different variety of faces. Um, so it was just kind of about that experience when you see people go from kind of in, maybe in a place they're not used to going, or even a place that they are used to going, kind of see that um, data kind of thrown in their face, um, what that experience is like. And it's kind of different from a top-down map. I mean, there is a top-down map of this exact uh, data set. Um, and, and you're immersed in it rather than above it. And you can only kind of see what's near you. Um, but it becomes much more personal um, because these things work at a human scale. Um, I'm going to show another demo in the same piece. So it's just a different data set. Um, this data set, take a second to load. There you go. Um, so this is um, personal injury claims against the New York City Police Department. 
Um, kind of addressing some similar topics uh, to what The Guardian is working on, but a different data set. Um, so each one of these is from 2013. We have about um, 3,800 data points. Um, I'm here on the Upper East Side. Um, and then when I sort of turn and look up at the Bronx, uh, it's, it's kind of jarring. Um, this data set is interesting. The experience is interesting because, again, this is something I can see on a map. Um, but what gets really interesting is, is when I experimented with um, putting myself at kind of different heights. I remember this is in an Oculus Rift, which you guys are not seeing. Um, when I go close to the ground in a neighborhood where um, these incidents are very dense, I find myself traveling around and sort of trying to navigate and avoid them. And it becomes evident that you cannot do that. They're so dense. I mean, if you think about how many Starbucks there are, like every block, this is just so many more than that. And you can't walk from point A to point B in a neighborhood without coming across someplace where this happened. Um, so I think that get, sort of tells a story of what this is really like to be immersed in a place where this is happening differently from the kind of objective uh, removed point of view of, of a, a top-down map. Um, so what do we learn from all this? Um, there's a few things. So one, um, as difficult as it is to build a simulation like this uh, in a web browser in JavaScript that runs on a MacBook Air or a phone, um, collecting the data is much harder. Um, so I'm just working with data sets that are out there. Um, there's a lot more we could do to visualize it, um, but this is what I've got. Like, I, you know, this comes from the city. So I think the, you know, the work that the, the Guardian is doing and, and other investigative journalists is really important to this sort of thing. Um, another thing that's interesting, um, as I talk to a lot of journalists about kind of this kind of work, um, is that they're sort of struggling with um, kind of the idea of, of objective representations of the world and data. Um, and I don't think, uh, you know, virtual reality works really well at sort of a human scale. And it is kind of inherently uh, emotional in that way. Um, so it's the documentary uh, community embraces that sort of experience really well. But I think as journalists, journalists are trying to kind of figure out where sort of they all stand with, with that. I think it's impossible to be truly objective in that way. Um, and finally, I think. Um, being, uh, as we're working with sort of data that you may be live data and, and you may not know what to do with it, creating an interactive experience is, is important. I think most of what we see in journalism and virtual reality is video based, which is not interactive. Um, but making an interactive piece uh, kind of enables you, you have to kind of build it as software and it has to be reactive to what's going on. And it enables a lot more in the way of accessibility. Um, so again, this is built in a web browser. Um, I don't have time to dig that up. But there are a lot of implications in terms of distribution, um, censorship, um, making it accessible to a broader audience. Like if you only have a phone, but you don't have a powerful desktop with an Oculus Rift, um, kind of making all that stuff work. Um, so there's a lot more to dig into there. Um, I hope that will inspire you to, to look further into it. Um, thanks very much. Uh, last and not least, we have Rachel Shutt, who's the Chief Data Scientist at News Corp. Uh, she's going to give us an inside look at the emerging role of the Chief Data Officer in journalism. Yeah. I will. OK, thanks. Hi. Whoops. Um, so I'm, uh, in the spirit of continuing the discussion around the role of data in journalism and media companies, I want to introduce into the conversation um, this emerging role that we're seeing of chief data officers. And we met highly before for, uh, the chief data scientist, the physicist at Mashable. Um, in the last year, we've seen uh, more and more companies and governments appoint chief data officers. And in this new role, it's not always well defined what the responsibilities are of those people, but largely the remit is to try to create value from the data. And within media organizations, I think the extent to which the chief data officer has a role in both the newsroom as well as the business side is still an open question. Um, and um, but I think I mean uh, that the responsibilities in my case, I, I feel a, my remit uh, includes both. Um, so just to give you a sense of um, a news corp has many businesses, and so that adds some complexity to what my, my role is. 
because overall what I'm trying to do is to create a global data strategy across our businesses, which include multiple titles such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the Times of London, the Sun, and many um, local newspapers in Australia. And so a large, the types of things I have to think about in this role, it's really about um, who, how to build teams, skills and capabilities within the businesses, uh, putting leadership in place around chief data officers into each of those individual businesses. Um, and uh, there's a large shift happening, which I really want to emphasize, which is the role of operational reporting to the role of building data products. And I would include uh, data journalism articles within the uh, concept of data products. Um, and, and largely, we want to be creating strategy and roadmaps for each business where we're really creating value from that data in terms of helping to build a sustainable business model for journalism. So wearing both hats of how to use data to drive the build business using predictive modeling around um, sort of what are our customers and our content doing, but then also within the newsroom, helping to make sure the, journalis the journalists have the tools and platforms and capabilities they need uh, to tell stories. Um, and so because of the sort of complexity of News Corp, though, there sort of uh, my responsibilities are both uh, to try to create, do, help each of the businesses do that locally, but then also uh, uh, share best practices across businesses. So, uh, but that, that's, uh, you know, that's something that may happen across other industries as well, where there's multiple business units within a business. So our approach, generally speaking, um, I like that Paul kept, uh, met, made a couple of references to DNA, because that's how I really think about it. It's about driving data, uh, introducing data into the DNA of the, of the culture, um, which involves building uh, cross-functional teams of doers and implementers, people. We refer talented people over tools um, and people. Uh, we have the belief that everyone on the team should be able to code, um, create data products in, uh, rather than static reports, these sort of ad nauseum uh, automatic reports that come out of Omniture um, web analytics tools that are hard for anyone to take any action on. And generally speaking, um, sort of the values are to try to create teams that are very agile and somewhat are, are more modeled off of software, engine, uh, software engineering processes uh, that, to create collaborative engagement models with stakeholders and um, also the, uh, build, uh, there's a strong design ethos in what we do. So I just wanted, uh, because it's, there's you know, a lot of complexities to what I, I'm thinking about, um, I, there's so much I wanted to respond to, everything everyone was saying, but there's, I just wanted to tell you five things uh, currently on my mind, which are one, just the organizational structure, recruiting, and this is where a lot of the innovation is around, is creating teams of technical experts and finding the right working model where they're embedded um, either with, uh, within teams or as a central team and, and coming up with the optimal model of either distributed uh, within the newsroom or within a central team where they're mentored by technical experts. Uh, creating team processes that help uh, make the teams effective and um, work quickly. Um, being able to impact the business by using data to create, uh, strategically to create value. Building data products and also um, that's should say that's ethics and um, algorithmic accountability. Um, and so making sure that the models we build that are supposed to predict don't actually cause. Uh, I don't have very much time left, but um, you know, there's a broad set of skills. And so I really think in terms of building inter interdisciplinary teams um, of people um, and that you know, the unicorn doesn't necessarily exist, that you need to have data engineers, data scientists, data journalists all working together. Um, and that you know, one, people might have a different set of combination of these skills um, to create an, a, a team. And I think these, these skills are, are relevant, in, relevant in the newsroom. Um, I want to also emphasize that you, this, this um, bifurcation between building data products and building, um, using data to try to make uh, data-driven decision making is one of the bigger uh, 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 differences that has happened in over the last few years. So building data products, meaning per, uh, personalization, um, building uh, targeted ad segments, building um, anything that sort of automatically is built into the product where the data and the code are driving the user experience um, and where you're actually then generating more data um, and that's uh, creating this sort of loop and there's a lot of sort of modeling and um, statistical complexities in, in the fact that you're deploying that product back into the real world and that um, also sort of touches on the ethical issues that we we're talking about. Um, uh, uh, impacting the business, I, I consider it the remit of the team 
Emily, I have one of your articles up here um, about, uh, I consider it part of the remit to the team to uh, find a sustainable business model for journalism. Um, like I said, the emphasis uh, on the teams is to be able to build products, not just uh, uh, operational reports, which is largely a consequence of this concept of datafication, where um, because of all the uh, devices we're carrying around, tons of data is being generated that we previously never had access to. And um, uh, I like this quote from DJ Patel, who's now the chief data scientist of the US government. But he said, data science is about creating narratives. It's about creating analogies, about using complex data to tell stories. Journalism is the model that we, as data scientists, should be looking to, um, because we're coming up against the same ethical decisions in terms of the models we're building. Um, and so um, how do you make editorial decisions about the algorithms that you're building? Um, and so I like also this, that data scientists should think like journalists and, and that w the opportunity for our data scientists to work alongside journalists has been actually one of the ways to recruit talented people because they're really excited that they can work on um, complex problems that could potentially impact the world. And so that, that, that's um, uh, been a good recruiting mechanism. Thanks. <laughs> We don't have uh, too much time left. I wish we had more, because I don't know about the rest of you, but that was a pretty three pretty fascinating presentations that we could talk about for a long time. I have one quick question for the panel, and then we can open it up to see what others have to say. Um, what, what can journalists today do to sort of best position themselves, do you think, to take advantage of these things that are coming up in the next five years? Because I think historically, I mean, Rachel touched on this a little bit already, but you know, in journalism, we tend to be a little slow sometimes to adopt technologies, and then we have to catch up to the first movers. Um, so I'm just wondering what kinds of things we can be doing now to position well for the future. Thoughts on that? Well, I, I mean, I'm a professor, so obviously I think that people should, uh, should take classes. Like should, <laughs> should educate themselves. I, I'm, I'm very excited about the uh, wealth of professional development opportunities that are out there today for journalists. Um, you have uh, graduate programs, you have uh, executive education programs, you have uh, informal education uh, opportunities like going to meetups or just hanging out with uh, computer scientists, hanging out with statisticians. Um, also, there's a lot of uh, professional development available through NICAR, the National Institute of Computer Assisted Reporting at Mizzou. Um, and uh, there are weekend boot camps. Like There are just lots of ways to, uh, to take advantage of educational opportunities. So it's very exciting. Um, I, I think a little bit of humility goes a long way. Um, I think when it comes down to it, whatever it is that each of us does is, is a craft. And I'm seeing with virtual reality, specifically this brand new medium, a lot of people going and being like, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to go make like a 10 minute epic immersive video piece. And it, I kind of want to say, look, you don't know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. This is brand new. So it doesn't mean don't do it. It means take a step back. Maybe get out of your comfort zone, try something different, and make, make like a little piece at a time and learn the craft. Because the, the consequences are, I don't know how big the consequences will be, but a, like a bad experience in VR is, is a bad experience. So I think there's a, see it as an opportunity to kind of start from scratch, like learn what this medium is or whatever the medium is. Um, build a little bit of time because it, and, and sort of avoid the waterfall method of throw everything in and come up with this huge piece. Like make a little bit, share the results, iterate, iterate. Right, yeah. You know, that, uh, that craft metaphor is, uh, is very powerful. I use that in mm. my class a lot. And one of the things that I say about, about data journalism is that you don't want to try and start big. Uh, the way that like if you're learning to cook, you don't want to start big. Like when you're learning to cook, you want to make scrambled eggs first. It's got one ingredient or two ingredients, or, you know, five maybe, but um, depending on how you make it. But like, it's okay to burn scrambled eggs, and you have to burn a lot of eggs before you can make decent scrambled eggs. You don't want to start off making like a Julia Child like cream puff tower, like the croquembouche with the cream puffs and the sponge sugar. Like, you can't make that until you've scrambled a lot of eggs and you've burned a lot of eggs. So start small and incrementally mm -hmm. get more complex in your projects. Yeah, I'd say collaboration is one of the key things. So I don't, I, I, 
it seems unrealistic to expect everyone would should become data experts overnight. And um, also, you know, I've invested a lot in my own education, so I believe it was valuable. And um, but I um, I think collaboration, like one of the things we try to do is do things like uh, data. We have some data thons where we we set up. Um, teams of data scientists, data engineers, journalists, and designers working together for a few days to try to accelerate projects and then to, to learn from each other. Um, and uh, we've also sponsored things like that at Columbia as well. So I think but trying to in, create collaborative um, Right. Um, so what are some questions? I saw Shazna, you had your hand up, right? Oh. I did, but I think you sort of. Oh, okay. Well, well no, I can respond really quickly. I mean, mm -hmm. All sort of touched on is always be learning, iterate, and collaborate. And on the theme of always be learning, um, I mean, I'm guessing like you have, Rachel, you have teams that have to const constantly be up to speed on what's next and what's coming up. And to some degree, they have to be doing it themselves. You're not going to go and learn about the new thing in an in in a class because it, nobody knows what it is yet, like you're saying, Brian. So um, how do you how do you sort of a, how do you encourage your teams to be self-directing themselves to some degree? Um, a, a lot of it. I mean, a lot of the challenges for the teams are around. They have, they have a lot of the skills. They have a lot of the academic skills and the scientific and technical skills. So it's less about that. It's more around um, understanding the business and understanding the application of those skills in a new context. Um, and so. So in some cases, I'm hiring for people who already have that, the skills, and then it's but then it's sort of making sure that they have the ability to embed well with the with the wider business and the wider teams. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a, a different a sort of a flip problem to think about if you have people who don't have those skills yet. Like I don't I don't think the skills we currently need are so advanced that they're sort of impossible for people to learn. Um, you know, obviously the stuff that you're doing is extremely advanced, but it's not like we're expecting the teams to do that right this second. Um, but maybe we should see. We, we could talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, other questions? Yeah. And uh, on virtual reality, I think, oh, I was just interested to, to hear what you think about where we're going in the future with that. Um, a lot of people, right now we're seeing it in game of gamification, and, and that's really taken off. But my understanding, it originated in a journalism project. And I'm really interested to see how it comes back to that and how people are really immersing in we, how we use that. So whether that's creating events where people actually go and everyone's involved in it, or if it still is a separated thing, like you said, on who has phone and who has access. But mm -hmm. basically, I'm just interested to see how, the, how we can be seeing that in the future for publishing or storytelling, essentially. Yeah. Okay. So that, that is a huge question. Um, so I'll take a little bit of it. Um, what I'm really interested in right now is kind of the, the biases that are built into the technology and the industry. Um, and we're seeing a lot of it is, is led up by games, right? Like uh, John Carmack is basically running Oculus, right? And he's this old school game guy, right? And you see that in all the sort of the ways that it kind of ripples out, right? It's like Oculus is only going to support Windows, for example, and, and all these sort of different things come out of that, or, or even in little ways, like a lot of people are building things with game engines, and game engines are sort of have these pre-built tools for building first-person shooters. So is everything going to be like a first-person shooter? Um, so I think, and, and we're seeing that in business models as well, where <laughs> things are moving towards like these very closed app stores, which have all these kind of really horrible consequences about like censorship and control and business models and lack of accessibility. Um, and, th and that also comes into what you asked about, like are, are these going to be sort of exhibitions or are they going to be accessible at home or, or mobile? Um, so that's why I'm working so hard to do this stuff through the web, because it addresses a lot of that. So I'm, I'm trying in my little way to help kind of steer it in a positive direction towards sort of um, you know, much more diversity in terms of like who can actually make things, not just who can view things. Um, I think that is going to be the, the sort of biggest battle, is can we overcome those biases or, or sort of pick which biases we, we kind of like? And that's, that's going to direct everything else in terms of accessibility, inputs, the form of the, the nature of the stories that are told. Uh, it's, it's a lot. I could go on. There's a, I mean, Rachel alluded to this, there's a, a, an emerging field of algorithmic accountability, 
um, and people are, are interrogating algorithms. They're also looking at software as something that is made by people. And people make mistakes, and people have biases. And what people do when they build software is they unconsciously embed their own biases in the software. So one of the, uh, one of the things we can do with software is we can be more transparent about it, and we can examine exactly what are the biases that go into it. And we can say, all right, can we actually engineer something that is more fair, that is going to promote diversity as opposed to being exclusionary? Um, but that's a, it's a process. We're only at the beginning of it right now. We have time for one more question, I am told. Yeah. So uh, my brother is a filmmaker, and he went to the um, uh, Tribeca Film Festival last year, and they had a demo of, uh, an Oculus demo uh, with the movie Wild. And he said he sat down and he saw this environment with the light coming down. I heard trees and birds and noise, and then up a path towards him, he heard somebody walking, and it was Reese Witherspoon, who sat down at a rock right in front of him, started talking to him, and sort of halfway through, he realized she was talking to somebody behind him, and he turned around, and Laura Dern was now sitting behind <laughs> him. And so he, a he said it was pretty cool, and then he, he asked if he could sit through the demo a second time, because nobody was in line. And he, this time he turned around to watch when Laura Dern would appear because at first she wasn't there and she never appeared because he was looking that way. So the narrative changed. So I was thinking as journalists, if you could use the world that you're creating to let us as the audience go into a story but explore the story according to our own, you know, go into the rooms we want, sort of explore that world but have different narratives built in. They're all authentic and journalistically sort of accurate, but let each person kind of explore that story. It seems like it would be so engaging, as opposed to just passively sitting there and having mm -hmm. somebody tell you a story. Um, OK, is there, how can I help? Is there a question? Or? Are you, sorry, are you looking at things like that in any of the experiments you're doing? Yeah. Sort of multiple paths through a story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, again, the, the sort of biases, that, that turns out to be very hard to do in video, um, the, the kind of Num a number of branches you can take is really small. Like that case, you, there's like two things you can do. Um, but, you know, so that's what I'm doing a lot more in kind of interactive, real-time generated things. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, um, in some ways, it's, it's a little more inherently interactive as a, a medium than, than sort of more traditional media. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's difficult because there's a lot of concerns. There, like, like there's what are the inputs that you have? You know, some people will have such and such controller, or some people might not have that controller at all. Um, some people have like, you know, position tracking where you can walk around a room, or like the cardboard thing where all you can do is kind of look. Um, so again, the craft of it is very challenging. Um, but yeah, absolutely um, working towards that. I, my, my, having worked in, in VR and other sort of interactive web-based media, um, I try to find sort of a balance between a kind of guided approach, but sort of alternating, like guide them and then let them roam around a little bit, then guide them and then let them roam around a little bit and kind of, uh, you know, explore, but not totally free on their own, because that can be really confusing. You know, I will also say that ProPublica is doing exactly this already. They're not doing it with video, but ProPublica's news apps, like the Surgeon Scorecard or Dollars for Docs. Uh, it's an interactive database that lets you go in and find out how the story is relevant to you in your life. So with Surgeon Scorecard, you can go in and you can search your surgeon uh, and find out what is the complication rate for the particular surgery that you're having. So I, as a journalist, can't say, oh, I know you're, uh, you, know, you have XYZ doctors, because that's unknowable. But I can say, here's a tool that you can use to look up your own set of doctors, and then you can go in and you can write the story yourself. You can localize it for yourself. So it's not immersive video, but it's pretty amazing. Yeah. All right, I guess we are uh, out of time. So thanks, everyone. Um, there are surveys on your chairs, so uh, you can drop those off on the table by the elevator. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.